Welcome, everyone, to the Pockets of Knowledge podcast. I'm your host, Desiree Stanley, and with me today is my guest, Cheryl Whitelaw. How are you today, Cheryl? I'm great. Great to be here. Thanks, Desiree. Wonderful. Well, I am excited to have Cheryl on the show. She's going to be talking about functional movement, and you are the CEO and owner of Peace and Power Movement Services, and you're a functional movement specialist. And so really, you're going to be talking about what that means and how that can benefit us in our lives. And so I'm very excited to learn more about this topic. So let's start with how did this kind of all come to be for you in developing this movement services? Yeah, no, thanks. And it's one of these journeys that if you'd asked me 20 years ago, would I be doing this now? I would have said absolutely not. I um, grew up in a family of teachers and farmers very focused on education. And so that was the path that I took. And I was always the weird kid, not just in the class, but when it started to be rooms of faculty and researchers and people looking to improve educational experience, I was still the weird kid in the class because I was sitting there going, you know, what about the body? We're doing all this mind thing. And I had several influences come in at the right time. But it really was a confluence of I had started the martial art of Aikido at age 46 and was really loving that kind of peaceful, you know, it's a martial art, but it's not it's not winning a fight. It's de-escalating a conflict. Right. And so really getting taken by that and starting to see incidents like the college that I worked at, there was more physical fights. You know, it was a political time where all of a sudden bad behavior was okay somehow. And I realized that all this mental communications, reaching across differences and connecting on similarities work that I've been doing, which is lovely, still my heart center. You know, when you're in conflict, all that goes out the window. And so it really put me on a journey to look at how to work with people in their body more. I was a coach at the time. And so started to bring some somatic-based, body-based things in. But I really connected with a couple of teachers who absolutely changed my course path to look at both how do we even know how we're moving and how we're moving well, and then applying that to how do I approach a challenge, and even more so, how do I approach a challenge I may not have the resources to do, which is in my world, one definition of trauma, when I've had some kind of unfortunate thing happen that I just didn't have the resources to meet, how can we use our body's innate knowledge, I call it somatic intelligence, to bring to the table all of the possible things that we could do that include senses, includes feeling, moving, and thinking, so that we're bringing all of ourselves into the movement. And I'm thrilled to find that when that's lit up, we become more compassionate. It is hard to really evoke a, an aggressive response on someone when you're really feeling and sensing them, right? We, we require a certain numbness from the neck down to do those sort of acts. So the more that this cultivates, the more those kind of high actualization kind of qualities become part of your day-to-day. And I'm talking about this in mundane sort of ways. I have a little pesky cat that at the wrong moment always jumps right on the keyboard or the papers or thing. And so it used to always be a little fight. Like now I have this little compassion about she just wants attention. This is so the wrong time. And I can connect with what she's needing and also what I need to do in terms of the boundaries and ushering her out of the room. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. And so it sounds like it was a progression in developing this. And so the Peace and Power Movement specifically, how did that come about? Yeah, so that's actually a reflection of I had started to really brand my work in terms of kind power and this sort of paradox of saying, how can we both be kind and powerful at the same time? And what does that mean for how we use power with people rather than assuming it's a power over someone? Peace and power came out of the pandemic. I'm just privileged to train with a really wonderful 
Aikido teacher. I've been with him 10 years, so I'm in the throes of preparing for my black belt test at age 55, which, you know, takes a village sometimes to keep the body going for that. But we started to say, okay, given how much this has changed, how people can access this kind of training, what can we do together? And so it became a collaboration about moving to online, as so many of us had to pivot, right, uh, from face-to-face services, but also saying, can we, you know, put out some offerings that really expose people to a core of some of these practices? There's only so many people who are willing to go into a martial arts studio full stop. And is there a way we can bring some of this wisdom out and have people have direct experiences through classes like we teach a poise class, which is very much connecting mind, body, and I would say spirit in terms of cultivating this intelligence or move freely class, which is really focusing in on functional movement and helping people discover themselves in a different way so that they can discover their possibilities and how they can move freely. And then as well as one-on-one work, because of course, every person's unique and, you know, there's a need to work with the specific patterns, but also the specific personal history that someone brings to this moment. Oh my gosh. I love that, that you're covering all the different facets of of where we're at right now. And you mentioned the pandemic and, and having to make some changes there as many of us did, but still offering it in a way that suits more people because like you pointed out, not everyone is going to feel comfortable stepping into a, a martial arts studio. And I myself personally have not um, completed martial arts. However, my children both ha- have their black belts um, in Taekwondo. So I took them to a martial arts studio frequently, but not everyone is comfortable, uh, certainly, with that. And Aikido is quite different than Taekwondo. We're not talking about the same thing at all, but it's fantastic that you're doing this at the age that you are, because it's just another way to show we, our only limitations is ourself, right? The limitations that we put on ourselves. And so that you are the age that you are and doing this is is fantastic. And I think is such a great example um, of what's capable, what what we're capable of. So I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And then I want to dig in a little bit more. You talked about kind power and that's something that I want to know, like what you mentioned it briefly. It's not a power over someone, right? But let's talk about it a little bit more. What does it mean? And how does that relate to, you know, being resilient? Yeah, to me, it's when I think about functional movement and this question of power, first of all, especially as women, we want to talk about it, but not always in a physical way. Like often we do internal bolstering, emotional, you know, building ourselves up. What I would say is that's great. I I love that kind of mindset and heart set. And when you're in a situation where you really have to really set boundaries or really exert some kind of power, usually it's verbally. I, I guess I'm lucky to live in a sort of neck of the woods where, you know, I'm not really looking at physical violence on the streets. There's many places in the world that are having that kind of reality. But we shrink away from knowing ourselves such that we know how we physically can move with power, that we know what the possibilities are. I'm literally the last person who wants to get into a physical fight. When you train with force week in, week out, you see how harmful that can be, right? And so, you know, it's like I would do anything I could to just not go into that place. But it's a different choice when you know you have capabilities about it, that you know you would have some options about how to manage yourself, you know, how you could exert enough control to change the outcome of a situation should you require it. And, you know, I love Aikido. It's a particular form. I would say, you know, any kind of physical form that helps cultivate in you gives you a kind of sense of, you know about your power. You know that you have options and you're not afraid to exercise that. You know, I I have worked over the years as 
different people, but particularly women come. And, you know, part of the training is someone has to punch you and then you do a response. And inevitably, we have a 10 minute sort of mini tutorial of, I need you to punch me like you mean it. Right. Because we grow up, I, you know, I never fought. Well, I have sisters, like it was verbal, you know, it was about somebody's Barbie getting trashed or, you know what I mean? Like it, it was not that kind of direct experience. So, so really owning like I can exert power, but also I can receive power and be okay. So, so that's, you know, a lot about the power. When I think about that, I can break that down in terms of functional movement and structures. But it really is a learning process where you come into knowing what you're capable of and what's possible so that you can face some of those limits. Because we are, you know, the pandemic really did a number on everyone. We want everything to be safe 100%. We want everything to be controlled and covered for us. But that's never really been the real world. And so it's you really, when you know yourself to go to some of your own limits and be able to have possibilities there, that then you know you have some power at your control. The kindness piece, to me, it's an inside and an outside kind of game. And so one very common thing is, what do you use your power for? And very much I'm influenced by the Aikido template that says, I may have the strength and the the know-how to really harm you, but I choose a response that is less harmful. I, you know, I can't say 100% not harmful because it depends what's happening, but the intention is not to kill or, you know, hurt the other person, even if they're attacking aggressively. And so it's, you know, how do I use this with someone to de-escalate a situation, to bring something back under control and to make those choices that provide a possibility that the person who gets up off the floor after you've, you know, put them down there may not come with even more hatred, with even more aggression. Again, in my lived life, this happens much more verbally, right? Like I'm not uh, encountering this, but it is those sort of things that, you know, if someone says something that could be triggering, could be, you know, something that isn't okay, how reactive are you or can you meet it from your own center from your own center of your power and have that conversation you know like i several times a day with my cat this is not okay with a neighbor with a colleague you know can you come from a place where you you still own your own power rather than being pushed into some other kind of reactive frame i would say that you're not in control of yourself you're not responsive to yourself The last little internal bit, I would say, of the kindness is we kind of violence in many ways starts at home. You know, I had a post out today, you know, to my audience about New Year's resolutions and what are the hidden habits that get in the way of starting something new. And one is that we set our expectations way up here. And it's, you know, it's like it's completely unreasonable to think that we would be perfect If we haven't done a thing before, yet we do that kind of number to ourselves over and over. So it's not saying don't have goals or don't have standards, but it's like, you know, where is that place for kindness? If it was your best friend starting a new exercise program and the first couple of weeks they screwed up about it, would you, you know, the harshness that comes from me to me, I would never go to a friend like you have no business being, you know, trying to get more fit. You'll never get to get we have this kind of internal voice all the time. So it's really extending that kindness and compassion to include ourselves so that we're actually supporting ourselves. So, you know, whenever I do something like that, including, you know, the starting martial art middle age, that inner cheerleader that every time there was a voice like, I don't think you could do this. You know, you can barely get out of the car after your training session. Who are you kidding? That little cheerleader that says, well, Okay, it looks like you can get out of the car and then we can get out of the garage and then we can, you know, baby step sometimes and then we can get the ice pack and, you know, whatever. But to say, why don't we support ourselves with that kind of kindness when it happens on the inside? It's much more likely to happen on the outside. Cheryl, that's fantastic. Everything that you just shared is awesome. And I want to touch on a couple of things. One, I think you're right that so often we our harshest critics, right? 
And we need to have that compassion, like you said, for these things that we're attempting that are, is not something we've ever done before, or maybe we've tried before and we've struggled with before, but we're trying again. And it's just have that compassion that you would have for your best friend or your, your significant other or your child or whomever um, is in your life that you care about. I think that's such a great point. So thank you for, for sharing that again. And I love that you were talking about the fights that you maybe were in growing up. It was never physical. It was verbal. And for myself as well, I never engaged in any kind of physical fights with siblings. It was always yelling, you know, that kind of thing. So having that experience, but now learning what you've gone through, what you've done and how now, you know, I can control myself. I can maybe change the outcome of a situation that I find myself in. And that kind of, uh, it, I think a little bit more security that you've got those options <laughs> that you can get yourself out of a situation, hopefully. And so I think that's a great reminder if somebody is considering some self-defense or something um, like this, a keto um, as an option, yes. If that's going to help you feel a little bit more like you can get out in the world, because again, as you said, we can't control everything and we sometimes find ourselves in environments that are not safe, but this gives us maybe a little bit of a chance because we've got some skills, right? Yeah. So I think that's awesome. And just for me, the kind of alchemical bit in all of this is how we use our awareness and our attention. And, you know, what's been far more valuable to me than any kind of techniques I've learned is being able to have a certain quality of awareness. So I notice the person over there or the, you know, there's a voice down the street that I'm not sure about the tone. And so it doesn't mean I go into a fight mode, but it means I pay attention and notice what's going on. That kind of advanced, you know, alert system. So many people, they walk down the street, they're looking at their phones. They have no, they're so unplugged for their environment. There's just no way that they, even if they had mad skills, they wouldn't notice the situation until they literally walk into it. So it's, again, like cultivating this sort of whole person intelligence and then just letting that be active in your day, you know, paying attention, just even driving, noticing potential risk. It doesn't have to be some kind of assailant intending you harm. It could just be a car that's cruising through a bit of a light as it turns red and noticing that as a potential risk. So you could choose a response rather than realize, oh, it's too late. Yeah. Great point. Another great point. Thank you for, for sharing that too, because I think that it, it, is really happening more frequently because of everybody being, you know, looking at their phones, that we're not paying attention to our environment. And even just that awareness in general um, makes a difference. And so another great point. So thanks for reiterating that. Let's talk now a little bit about the functional movement side. And so I know with Aikido, there's physical movements that you're doing. But so how is this playing into functional movement and is it, is it separate? Yeah, and for sure, I definitely have this kind of lens now that I see all movement in terms of function. And so what does that mean? And, you know, it starts really with the question of how do we learn to move and how do we know when it's good enough, right? Like you think about if you've had kids when the whole process of they learn to have the cup and they learn to have, bring it to their mouth. There's a lot of spilling there. You know, the sippy cup was literally like the best invention ever, right? Because literally they're learning that movement pathway to do it. And then they have to do it enough that they get pretty effective with it and efficient. And generally we learn most of the movements that we need in a sort of day-to-day -day way in somewhere or other, you know, as we come up into adulthood. We tend to put sports and dance and those sorts of things to one side, often because there's a longer training period. You know, we don't acquire the skills to play basketball unless we grow up in a family that plays basketball. So there's a training in terms of the performance of specific movement skills. But when I look at all of them, 
I tend to ask questions like, for what someone's wanting to do in the environment that they're doing it, is it functional? Is it happening? And how costly is it? We could see in, you know, a high level of sports, the degree of training, the amount of work that an athlete does to really create like the most optimized performance for their body. It's a costly endeavor. There's a lot that supports them, you know, in terms of maintaining their body for nutrition, massage, like cold baths, like a whole gamut of strategies because of how much they're asking for their body. They need that kind of high level of support. And for many athletes, there is a kind of end date, right? We've seen there's a great documentary right now called Nyad about a woman who swam between Cuba and Florida in her 60s. You know, and so she blew open those expectations. And I think we're seeing more and more of that. But part of it is because I think people are increasingly learning how do I move efficiently, effectively, using myself in ways that create the kind of power or speed or, you know, what, whatever quality that you're looking for. If it's a dancer, it could be about grace and fluidity in a way that you're using all of yourself really well. I often am seeing clients that sort of hit mid-age and the way they've been doing what they're doing, something's starting to wear out. And people tend to blame, oh, my knee and it's no good. I look at what they're doing to see what's happening such that your poor left knee is getting blamed for it, right? It's taking the bread, something else isn't working, something else isn't working together. So it's really looking at the whole person to say, how are they moving in the field of gravity with the support of the ground? And how can we improve and refine the quality of that experience so that it costs less, it feels easier? You know, one of the touch bones I have being trained as a Feldenkrais practitioner, is it reversible? Meaning, have I committed everything and so I can't reverse it? Because a high quality mover and martial artists often have this quality, they can reverse and turn to attend to somebody else, you know, in an instant. And we don't tend to bring those sort of tests to the basics of like how I mow my lawn or how, you know, how I play a soccer game or even how I go on a hike. We don't bring those sort of way of looking at movement into our everyday functional movement. And some, sometimes into sports as well, there's a focus on the outcome the performance and the training, but maybe not so much on the process of how they've gotten there. And, you know, and, and that often can mean injuries or other kinds of prices to pay at the end of an uh, athletic career. Yeah, that's so interesting, Cheryl. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. And it sparked something that the thought when you were discussing the issue with the knee per se, but so many of us are sitting so much. And I know that wreaks habit on the body because that's not how our body was designed or intended to be all day, just sitting in a chair at a desk. And so I, I don't know if we want to touch on this and, and how we can maybe uh, counteract some of that long time sitting and see if, you know, we can maybe share something with the listeners that could be helpful. But also what you mentioned about the the movement and turning quickly in a direction, it also made me think about just even emptying the dishwasher, you know, bending down, standing up, twisting, turning, reaching. All of these things are, are what we do on a daily basis. But as we age, those things become more difficult because we're not really working our body optimally to continue those movements, right? Yeah. When I, I have an online course called Sitting is the New Smoking, and it's, you know, looking at, I have this too, as much as I move and work with clients, I'm sitting in front of the computer for hours every day because this is a huge work environment that we're all involved in. And so I would never say to someone, so you shouldn't do that. You know, even the standing desk and the treadmill, that's, not, that's great, but there is a reality to how our work is, you know, work environment is conceived that we do it for many hours at a time. We do it every day. Like, so, you know, I look at that and say, so how do we make that more functional? And what's dysfunctional about sitting in the computer position? Like I literally just worked with a client earlier who year end, you know, like 
totally. And, and it was killing her. So it's like, how do we make that more functional in terms of both how she moves and the posture and the duration? So, you know, I tend to look at things like what makes sitting dynamic, right? The problem isn't how we sit necessarily. It's how long and then the small things of posture, like I, I call it the computer hunch. It, it sets up a, a requirement in our body to hold our head up use muscles in a way that they're not really designed to be used. Um, and then we do that for several hours. So how do we find efficiencies about that? The easiest way that I often start with people is literally just to locate the bottom of their pelvis. So it's the bumpy parts. If you feel up un under your own personal bottom, right, you can feel two little, two little bumps. And to relocate that on your chair so that you can find a place of where it feels like you're centered over them, where we're so used to either being forward or slumping back, we lose track of that. Like it's literally a core tripod um, of our, you know, bony pelvis that if we could sit from there comfortably, a whole bunch of work disappears because your spine then is doing what it needs to. And as long as you can reach the keyboard, you don't have to distort that line. So I'm not actually an advocate to having like perfect posture because we can't keep that up either. But, you know, these small sort of differences that make a huge difference, how do you find them? And then I'm a big fan of the tiny practice or the pocket practice, you know, so I've just been working for an hour in the report. What pocket practice do I need right now to bring me out of work mode and bring me back into the whole breathing, living person that needs a little bit of movement? Because I may not be able to get up and take a walk for half an hour. If I can, great. That's awesome. But it's part of the reality of our work environment. Let's make it functional by making sitting a more dynamic experience. And I'm also a fan of chair dancing. So that's, you know, you could also just get your little boogie on, you know, to give yourself a bit of a movement break as you're sitting. Oh, that's, that's fun. I love that. So thank you for sharing that. And the chair dancing, that's awesome. But what you were talking about with just those micro movements and for those who are listening, maybe not watching on YouTube, you know, you're talking about adjusting your shoulders and sitting a, maybe a little bit taller and then feeling those bones, you know, so that you're just making these micro adjustments and the difference that can make sounds like it's huge over time, right? Yeah. Yeah. As we're, you know, have gone through a process of the efficiencies that go from incandescent light bulbs to like LEDs, you know, that it's a, it's a pretty good analogy that when you're able to rely on your skeleton to do that sort of core supportive work of sitting upright or standing, um, then your muscles are freer to move you, but also the postural muscles are freer to just do what they do. Like they keep you upright in the field of gravity. And so it literally creates a freer movement that that takes less energy, you know, and less creates less inflammation. There's a whole cascade of things that don't happen because you're just working less, but you're working all together. Like I always say if all of you is working together in a way that's well coordinated or well organized, it it takes an LED light to, to send you somewhere rather than a big, you know, beam. We're so used to the idea that it has to, it takes effort and we need to work hard. And it's like we do at some things, but movement, you know, in terms of our day-to-day -day function, there's a lot of ease that we overlook because we're hooked on this idea that somehow it, it needs to be hard or we have to try rather than doing the work to find the place of easy and then move forward and get used to that feeling, right? It's actually quite joyful and pleasurable to move in easy ways. And, you know, as kids, maybe we knew it, but as adults, we got serious and we forgot it. Yeah, as so often happens, as we grow up and are faced with realities, right? We lose so much of the, the joy and the laughter and the play that kids just naturally have. We can bring those things back. So let's remember that if we choose to. And I love that you said that these things can be easy. They don't need to be hard when you're talking about making some of these adjustments. And really, we like easy. 
most of the time we want easy. So if we remember that these things can be easy, then they should be easy to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. There can be work in finding them, in associating with them. You know, the kinds of work I did today with a client, I've had several women talk about early influences in posture about what you're supposed to do with your chest. Like either, you know, you're supposed to be modest or you're supposed to sit up straight. And both of those early messages have changed habits about where shoulders are compared to ears, compared to your chest. And so really, you know, they can become so familiar that the hard seems right. Mm -hmm. So it is this kind of discovery of self that opens up, like, how is it easier to have a kind of relationship between shoulders and hips and, you know, how your chest is open. That again, isn't about being perfect, but it starts to have a feeling of openness and the ability to move and turn that once you've discovered that, again, it's a much easier option. So when you find yourself exerting a ton of effort, you can go, wait, actually, let's back up. I can do it from here. And it's much easier. Yeah. Oh, great point. Thank you for expanding on that a little bit. I think that's very helpful information for us to remember. So thank you. And I want to talk a little bit about something that you share a lot, and that's how we can fully live and I'm trying to remember how you say living verbs. And so let's talk about that. It's thinking, feeling, sensing, and moving. And we did just briefly mention it at the beginning, but let's talk a little bit more deeply about what that means. Yeah. It's if you, like whenever I talk about it, it's, I always, there's a little voice that says, you know, this is so basic, right? But we've developed a world that has taken us away from verbs into nouns. So you think about when I introduce myself, what do I say? Well, I'm a noun, you know, I'm a functional movement specialist. I don't say I'm a dancing, I'm a breathing, I'm a laughing, I'm a play. Like we we literally don't identify with our verbs. And as occasionally when I've done facilitations, I'll do that as an icebreaker. Give me a noun, but you also have to give me three verbs that introduce you. And often people can't, like they laugh. It's you know, because we're so identified with the label that we call ourselves, which is usually a noun. And, and so in that case, we become a small, like I say, we're a small distance from ourselves because we become this abstraction of my labels and this is who I am. What I like about going into the verbs and the, these four verbs, thinking, feeling, sensing, and moving, again, are coming from Moshe Feldenkrais's work about what makes for a, a sort of fully lived human being. And it relates to, in our current world, we might be thinking, you know, we might be sensing in terms of seeing a screen, seeing our cell phone, you know, whatever. But I often find, like, when people come to see me, they may have two out of the four kind of active in their life, that there's something about how we've related to technology, our indoor environments that often I find sensory qualities, like how smooth, how much pressure, you know, what kind of texture do we sense? Is it hot? How hot? Is it like all of that sensory experience, which are our bodies, our nervous system, our, you know, every moment we're receiving sensory information, but somehow we've taken this in this nouning of ourselves we don't really acknowledge sensory other than extreme events like the, the stove is hot or I agreed to do a New Year's Day plunge in the ocean in Canada. So, you know, called with another adjective with that, you know, so we tend to do peak events, but we don't, especially as we age, if we don't explore our sensory experience, our body works on demand. You know, this is the nature of the neuroplastic blade. Like we... If we use it, we keep it. If we don't use it, we lose those connections. And so, you know, our capacity to sense can recede, not because we can't, but it's because we don't. And so I, I had an experience on my Feldenkrais training. I have an older home, wooden floors, there's wood grain. And I went through three days of thinking I was stepping on a post-it note, you know, because it felt like there was something on my foot and I'd lift my foot. There's nothing on my foot thinking I'm going just a little bit crazy. 
And then by day three, I realized I was feeling the grain texture in my floor in the same way I would with my hands, that I'd done enough somatic work that some of those sensory receptors turned on again and I could perceive more. And, you know, it only took me three days, right, to, to figure that out. But it was a great lesson in, you know, we walk in shoes, we walk on flat floors. We don't give our feet anything interesting to do often unless we can get out to the beach or we, you know, walk in barefoot in the lawn or, or whatever. And so we literally can lose sensation and we don't know it's gone. So think about if you've ever done an experiment, like sometimes they do this to experience aging where you have glasses with a very thin window and you have big cottony gloves on and other sorts of things that sort of dampen what you can feel, we take for granted. And then we start to lose that sometimes at middle age. The beauty of the neuroplastic brain is we can turn that back on and reacquaint ourselves with sensing. But it's one of those things that, you know, think about how balance works. If you actually can't feel the floor clearly, or you can't tell, am I on the edges of my toes or the ball of my foot? Like it, it starts to become a real impact, not knowing when I'm close to the edge of tipping. And so this was one of the things I focused on early in my practice, because it makes a big difference. You know, falls, even at midlife, can change the trajectory of like how the quality of your health, the quality of what you can do, even in your 50s. So it felt like a really good place to bring sensing into the pool that has to change your thinking, right? Once you're savoring, really perceiving your experience, it's more information. It broadens what you're thinking about rather than rattling around in your skull size kingdom with, you know, whatever you're thinking, you're getting new inputs that matter, that, that make a difference to change how you're seeing yourself, how you're seeing the world. And then the base of that movement, we do have a pretty sedentary life. And so it, it changes how we understand ourselves and our environment if we never get out for a walk. I'm really conscious right now, big snowstorm where I live today. And so going outside, it's cold, it's windy, it's but we really start to lose connection with people beyond ourselves, with the environment, with, you know, everything around us. So it changes who we are when we don't live fully from these four verbs. And, you know, I appreciate Moshe Feldenkrais's work because he really gave a fresh way to look at how we can reacquire that well before there was even a word for the neuroplastic nature of the brain. And it's our birthright. It's available for all of us. Excellent stuff, Cheryl. Thank you. I found that so fascinating. And my couple of other podcast episodes, we've talked about neuroplasticity. So again, I'm going to tell the listeners, go do some research on that because it's fantastic. But I love what you're talking about. First of all, I so relate to the nouning and how we really just describe ourselves in nouns. So I totally can relate to that. But I want to talk about how we can begin, because it's so important what you were describing about not feeling our feet on the floor, not recognizing, are we on our toes? Are we getting ready to tip or fall? Because especially as we're getting older, this becomes a big issue. So what can we do to begin to bring that, you know, sensory back in, like you were motioning with your hands, there's a big cotton thing over your hands so that you lose that sensation of touch in your fingers. So what are things that we maybe can do to work on not losing those things or bringing yeah. them back? Yeah, I'm a big fan of, even though I teach a class and there's many awareness through movement is the brand name of classes in the world that, you know, are designed to do that work. I'm a big fan of it tends to be only an hour a week or whatever people put into it. So there's all this other time to practice things like, you know, the, when you peel your orange in the morning, how much do you attend to the feel of the rind? How much pressure do you need to get that first cut in so you can start peeling the smell of it, the weight of it, 
I play, you know, often game when I'm shopping is like, how well can I feel the comparative weight of oranges for a juiciness factor? Any, anybody who shops knows that, but it's a practical way to bring that sensory experience right front and center into the process of eating an orange and to really, you know, th feel like how does the texture and the slidiness inside of your mouth, you know, happen as saliva develops as you're chewing. We tend to be so goal oriented, oh, well, gotta eat well, gotta eat the orange, put the orange in and it's over, right? And it's like there's all of this, you know, the word savor, but I would say just a more naive sense of like all of those pieces have a sensory component. Can we open ourselves and our awareness to just noticing it? Because it literally, that's the secret sauce. If we pay attention enough, to notice it, it becomes something in, in our brain, at least chemically. If we do that over and over, it becomes structurally wired in our brain. And you could say, well, I don't really want to be a master orange appreciator. That's not really a noun that I'm going for. I can say for myself, like at 46, I was not a martial artist. I started a martial art many times, thought, what am I doing here? There was a few skills I was, you know, really bad at, like rolling and I was dizzy. But there's this thing with when you keep moving, when you keep doing something, at a certain point, it does, you do become that now. You become the person who does do Aikido or the person who gardens or can walk or hike or what, whatever, you know, the thing that you think, oh, I can't do that now. It is literally the possibility that takes us there, but we have to continually move and sense and feel and think for us to become this thing that today I might say, you know, I can't do that. It's not who I am. And it's like, that's a story. And that may be true for historical movement, but it doesn't mean it predicts the possibility in the future. Yeah. Excellent point. Love that. And I think that when you're talking about the orange and peeling the orange and, you know, no, maybe every day we don't have time to stop and look at every action that we're taking. However, remembering to be in the present is such a great point with whatever you're doing, because the present is all that we have, right? The present now is our life. And so um, we forget <laughs> and are so future oriented or goal oriented, like you said. but stopping to feel the orange in your hand and feel that peel as it's going and smelling the smell of the orange citrus, which you immediately are hit with. Mm -hmm. I think that it's so great to remember to take time to do that and that it can help your brain is even better. Yeah, that's right. Things often taste better on vacation. Usually it's because we've slowed down to actually notice and enjoy. You know, right. like we, we don't have to go away somewhere to make that happen, but we often wait until we have time to go away on a break to, you know, engage in that kind of slower, more awareness, more attending kind of presence. Yeah. Well, Cheryl, I have really enjoyed our conversation and it's so interesting to me at this concept of the functional movement. And I feel like each of us really can take the points that we have discussed and make small changes in in what we're doing in our daily lives. I think it's super easy to do that. And so thank you for sharing these with us so that we can begin to improve on what we're doing in our lives. So I think that's awesome. And I thank you for sharing that. You've mentioned a couple of times a particular training that you are, and I don't know the name exactly. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's a person's name. It's called Feldenkrais. So, and, and yes, it's his name, Moshe Feldenkrais. It's a learning method that uses movement to improve how the brain and body move and function together. So it's quite an interesting way to look at the world, but it's a method like often people, you know, use it to improve their movement but it's been applied to artistic methods. I learn business and entrepreneurial, you know, concepts through the Feldenkrais method. There, there's lots of places that you can apply it. 
he picked movement because it's so concrete, right? You can tell when something's changed in your movement and it was an easy feedback to work with. Awesome. Well, I will for sure include his information in the show notes so the listeners can take a look at that because I, I think that's fantastic. If it's applicable in so many realms, you know, anybody could find that book, pick it up and, and get something from it. So thank you for sharing that. Is there any other books that you have found beneficial that you'd like to share with us now? Yeah, there's a couple. When I think about something that's really accessible, really relatable, I actually pulled it off my bookshelf. It's called Playing with Movement by Todd Hargrove. And he does a great job of really just going into that era of performance and breaking it apart into the kind of chunks, you know, very similar to what we've been talking about today. He's not coming from my particular background, but I find he really, you know, speaks about in a way that is helpful for people to pick up a new perspective. The other one that I really like in terms of brain plasticity is the brain that changes itself by Dr. Norman Dodge. You've probably encountered this if you've talked about it before. He is a, a Canadian researcher, but he's really trying to help, you know, through his role of sharing research and stories to say what's the next frontier about how we can make this plastic nature of our brain improve things for us, whether it's in the context of diseases that are deep and curable or just improving how we live our lives. Excellent recommendations. Thank you for that. And I'll include those as well in the show notes. And do you listen to other podcasts? Do you enjoy listening to podcasts? Is there any that you'd like to suggest? Yeah, I do. And I certainly listen to ones that are probably better known. I, I always like to mention ones that maybe aren't quite as well known. So really discovered last year, a great one. It's called The Unlearning Podcast with Christina Jones. Unlearning, but spelled like U-N-L-3 at R-N-I-N-G, probably because, you know, it was already taken. She really has a great perspective about when you're learning something, like what do you have to unlearn and what happens in that process? I really, really appreciate her perspective on that. Um, also really enjoyed um, your guided health journey with Melissa Dealey. She's um, looking a lot at, at nutrition and sort of other ways to work with the body. But from, again, this kind of whole person, whole self kind of approach, which is just, you know, once you get a taste for working in that way, rather than, oh, this piece and that piece, you always light up when you find other people speaking from the same self. Excellent. Great recommendations as well. So thank you for sharing those. Again, Cheryl, I have truly enjoyed our conversation. It's so fascinating to me. I love the idea of, you know, whole body, really, when you're talking about mind, body, and spirit, I think it's fantastic. And I love that you're just sharing this with as many people as possible. And the work that you're doing, I think, is important. So thank you for that. And thank you again for coming on the show and sharing this with us. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Desiree. It was really my pleasure. And I, I would say right back at you. Thanks for really trying to get quality knowledge out to people so that they can you know, improve things for themselves. It's a good mission. Keep it up. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we'll talk more soon. Okay, take care. If you have questions or want to learn more about Cheryl and what she's doing, or follow along on her journey, or just want to learn more about functional movement, check out her website at www.peaceandpower.ca. Her email is cheryl at kindpower.ca. And she can also be found on Instagram at Cheryl Kind Power. Thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in to another insightful episode of the Pockets of Knowledge podcast. We appreciate your time and curiosity as we explore fascinating topics together. If you enjoyed today's discussion, be sure to join us next week for another amazing episode. Remember, your journey of learning and growth is a continuous adventure, and we're thrilled to be part of it. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next week, stay curious and keep exploring those pockets of knowledge.